today's session on action research. Uh, this is Nellie Deutsch. If you could add in the chat box uh, where you're from and um, anything else you'd like to add, like the weather or um, where you are, uh, whether you're at work, at home, uh, what room, or anything else, uh, feel free to use the chat box to communicate. All right, today's uh, PowerPoint presentation is uh, right here. Let me uh, share it with you so uh, you can use it as we go. I'll be screen sharing, hopefully, but uh, in case I... Uh, don't manage, you'll be able to get everything there. So there's the PowerPoint presentation. People will be coming as we go. Um, and feel free to ask questions, as I said. So we've got Venezuela. Oh, I'm so sorry for anyone who's not well today. Sorry, Tom, uh, that you're still in bed. But I hope you're resting because <laughs> being in bed could be really nice. So I hope it's uh, it's a good rest. And um, We've got uh, the UK there. Uh, welcome. And um, I don't see uh, India, I presume. All right. So, uh, oh, and it's raining. I'm sorry. You're in Bombay and it's raining there. Sorry. I don't know. The rain could be good. I hope it's not raining too much. All right. So there you can get a little bit of information about me. Uh, most of you know me, so I'm not going to uh, to go through it, but you can read that, and we'll get started. Uh, how many of you are um, following the action research as we go? Uh, just let me know in the chat box if you're managing to uh, get things done with the action research. If you're not, don't worry about it. Um, Research is not something that we do overnight <laughs> or that uh, we do uh, quickly. It takes time. It takes a lot of thinking, uh, but specifically the right time for the right uh, research. So uh, you're learning, and that's important. Once you get the hang of it, I'm sure that uh, you'll find it very, very useful. Okay, so let me just uh, stop here. All right. So today's uh, session is about um, action research, but the qualitative and quantitative analysis and what the two mean. I've added a um, video for you to follow. I'll explain the differences between qualitative and quantitative. Um, let me just uh, get that going here so that we can get into the analysis. It's important to understand the concepts, methods, before um, actually starting out so that you know uh, where you're going. Any thoughts there? Oh, hello, we've got Hawaii too. Wonderful. Um, what are the major differences? If you can think of one word uh, that typifies and differentiates qualitative from quantitative, and actually the words say it, there's quality, which might be the wrong word, because quantitative could be qualitative in the sense that it's quality-wise. But um, if you could think of a word for each. Um, I'm not sure if opposites is the right word, but they certainly are different. Any, any uh, keywords for qualitative as opposed to uh, quantitative? You know what they say in Chinese uh, philosophy? There's no such thing as opposites. It's just one spectrum, and it's uh, at one end or the other end, but it's all one. So uh, that's just a philosophical idea of opposites. That's right. Very good, Brian. So we've got numbers, okay, which means qualitative, quantitative, sorry. And then we've got words that are qualitative. So we express uh, qualitative ideas through words in our research. That's how we, we analyze words when we're doing uh, 
qualitative analysis and we analyze numbers when we're doing quantitative. So if you think about that, what do you prefer, words or numbers? Okay, if you could just add W or N. All right, so we've got him lots of words. Numbers, okay. Uh, is that Nini? Words, my cousin's name was Nini. Uh, she lived in France, in uh, the south of France. And so we've got a few numbers. Yes, my cousin was a female. Unfortunately, she's not around anymore. But yes, she was a female. Uh, Nini. Um, Nini Muller. M-U-L-L-E-R. She lived uh, in the south of France. She was uh, uh, a very dear person. Right. So some of you, um, Brian, you're saying hi again. Hi. Um, some of you may like numbers more than you like words and vice versa. But that's not a reason <laughs> to choose uh, qualitative over quantitative. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, even though you might like words, you may prefer to do, and it may suit your study, to do a quantitative and not qualitative. Where do you think there's more work in a qual? or quan. Where is there more work? I'm asking you a lot of questions just to get an idea here. Qual. Okay, that's right, because words are very, very difficult. It's very difficult to measure words. So quan is actually a lot easier, but people are uh, get confused because they think, well, if it's numbers, I don't like numbers. It's confusing, but it's a lot easier very much easier. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind as we go. So let me see if I can get the media player here to uh, do its job. Oh, I see I didn't add it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, it's in the uh, PowerPoint presentation, so you should be able to uh, get it from there. It's also in the uh, live online uh, class link. Okay, here's the class link. Sorry, it should be there. I don't think it's in the PowerPoint. Okay, so there it is. You should be able to get the... Uh, Okay, it's called qualitative. Let's see if I can uh, actually get it right now, and then I can just add it. I thought it was cute. It's only uh, two minutes. Let me get it. It's only two minutes, so it's not I'm closed or open questions. Even if you're doing a qualitative uh, research study, you may begin with closed, but you can always go to open and get your participants or your subjects interpretation or ideas. But when you're doing quantitative, you are giving them the information. Remember that. So you're using only multiple choice or grading kind of questions, but the questions are closed. So think about it. Is that the kind of research that you want? A research that forces you to ask closed questions. Now, in order to ask closed questions, you have to know something. So sometimes uh, researchers start with a qualitative study to get information, and then they use that information to come up with a survey that would work for a quantitative study and vice versa. You may start with a quantitative and then try to test it out by using open-ended questions based on the close part. Does that make sense? Just give me a smiley or a thumbs down or any kind of reaction if what I just said makes sense. And if you're doing a combination, that's right, Hemlata, it's called mixed. And that's the reason why it's a good idea to mix. 
All right, so qualitative and quantitative uh, analysis. You have to think of things beforehand. Thinking is very, very important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through an action research project, just as a, a review, uh, and then give the results that I got from one of my action research, and then continue talking about the differences between qualitative and quantitative analysis. So the first thing we have to start with is a problem. You're going to try to understand, research, and get lots of information about a problem that you think is very, very important for the world to know. And you're going to get the information because you're going to be the expert of this problem statement that others may have or may not have. You may be the first one to have this problem and you may not be. But in any case, you are going to be the expert in this problem. All right, so what is your problem statement? You have to state it very, very clearly. And in your problem statement, you need to have certain parts. What are those parts? Anybody know? What do you need to have included in your problem statement? Think of a statement, any kind of statement, uh, and if it's a general statement, what do you think it should have? If you look at the uh, PowerPoint presentation, you'll get the answer. But think about it. What should it have? Well, this is what it should have. First of all, it should have the purpose. You, in your problem statement, you should state the purpose of doing this. Why are you come up, coming up with this problem? Who cares? And if it's about you, everybody cares. So what is your purpose? Well, think of one purpose, your purpose, in doing any kind of um, research. Why are you doing it? So you might think, well, to help others who may have the same problem. Um, no, it has to be your purpose. The purpose has to be something uh, intrinsic. The reason that you are doing this, okay? So you have to think of the causes. What caused you to, to discover is what you're going to do as a result, okay, Brian? But what caused you to, to want to do this? Why are you doing it? Yeah, but what exactly is it? Okay, to find out what. Remember, it's a problem statement. So why are you trying to find information on the problem? It's not just to know. Remember, it's action. There's a reason, the action. What do you want to do as a result of this research? Okay, find out, but what are you going to do with it once you find out? We're teachers. Why do we do what we do? <laughs> because we want to help. Okay, so the cause is we want the reason you're doing it, your purpose is to help your students uh, get high grades, to help your, make your students happy. Uh, to make your students stress-free, to get your students smiling in the classroom, to get peace in your classes. Yeah, but what is the result? Okay, so um, because of technology, no, 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 no. Okay, we're talking about people. Okay, you want to help people. All right, so your purpose might be to determine why your students are not smiling or why your students are not using technology for learning or why it could be participants doesn't have to be students to determine why um, 
the people in your neighborhood are not saying hello to each other. Okay, so you have to determine the cause. Okay, so the causes, the reasons why you're doing this. And then build a curriculum program. You're going to build a program that'll get everybody smiling in the classroom. They'll get your neighbors saying hello to each other and smiling as they go by. Okay, do you get the idea? So um, we're going beyond discover. Okay, I don't know if you're writing anything I'm looking for. Just keep writing so I can uh, help out. All right, next, you're going to provide your students with techniques. Well, in my case, and I'll explain, my students were not getting good grades in their reading comprehension tests. And I wanted to build a program to help them get great grades, to help them understand what they're reading and to answer the questions and to pass exams because that's what the system required me to do. And I wanted to follow the system and make sure that my students were successful in this system of exams. All right. Um, and I wanted to provide them with techniques on how to take the exams so that they would get good grades. Reasonable? Yes. This was uh, over 10 years ago. And then I wanted them to improve their scores, of course, because that would make them happy. These were junior high students. It would make their, their parents happy, their grandparents happy. Everybody would be happy <laughs> if they did well on the test. Hello, Nevis. I'm glad you have the internet. Okay, so that's my purpose. All right. Next. Next, you need to add a background description of the school, of where this took place. In my case, it was a, an all-boys school, believe it or not. Yes, it was an all-boys school, junior high. And um, they also, some of them uh, didn't go home because they had no home. So some of them were actually orphans. Some of them uh, were foster children. Some of them lived in the dorms. There were, the population was quite poor. So you might think, well, Nelly, give up. No. So you have to mention the population. What population? Well, in my case, what's the population? Let's see if you were listening. Uh, you may write that in the chat box. That's right, somebody wrote improve, yes. The purpose is to improve. Yes, how old are they? What do you know about the population? Just make something up if uh, you don't remember. That's okay, maybe you'll hit the right answer. Cultural mix, definitely. Um, low economic, some of them were foster children, some of them were, uh, as I said, orphans, and age, the age group, of course, junior high. This was a grade nine class, in fact, so they were in their last year of junior high. And then the work setting. I was a teacher, so I have to explain, as a teacher, as their English teacher, um, okay, and what it was like to work in this um, particular school, the work setting, and then my role, okay, very important to put your role. Um, are you the teacher? Are you the administrator? Are you the parent? The parent can do an action research too. Are you the student? The student can do action research if they're old enough, or you know what, they could do it at any age. Oh my gosh, went in the wrong direction. How does this happen? Oh my gosh, everything's all backwards. All right, so let's take a look at um, the qualitative data analysis. Well, for qualitative data analysis, and if you're interested in this PowerPoint presentation, it's on the website. All you need to do is go to this particular website and you'll get everything there. Okay, so this is actually, even if you didn't buy the book, and I'm referring to Action Research, to this book, even if you didn't buy the book, you can still follow the course online. 
Okay, and here is the link. We're in chapter. Hello, everyone. And oh my welcome. gosh, sorry about welcome that. To... That's my cell phone there. Um, there's the link. And we're in chapter six on qualitative data analysis techniques. The PowerPoint, I adapted it slightly, but this is the PowerPoint. Well, not all of it, but the following slides are taken from there. Right. It's really a wonderful place. I suggest you follow it. You'll get all the information you need for the action research. And if you missed any classes, uh, that's your best bet. So qualitative data are analyzed inductively. Now we've got deductively and inductively. Inductively means that it's completely open. Uh, there's you're looking for observations. You look at patterns. In other words, um, we said, Hamlata agreed, that it's very difficult to come up with an analysis for qualitative because we're dealing with words. And words have different interpretations. It's how we interpret them. What we want is to see some kind of pattern. And we want to group the data according to uh, these patterns that we find. By the way, the way I did it uh, for my action research is that... I would sit on the floor with, I would have all these papers, sit on the floor, put them on uh, little pieces of paper and just play around like cards and try to see if I could find a pattern. There are different ways of doing it. It's a lot of fun. And I won't forget, my husband took a photo of me with my split. Well, I used to dance. So uh, doing the splits and having all these papers all over the place. Uh, trying to come up with a pattern. Now you'll say, well, Nelly, you came up with one pattern. Somebody else might come up with another pattern. Yes. And that's why the difference, the key difference, again, numbers, words between qualitative and qualitative is that qualitative um, can't be repeated in the same way. You won't get the exact same results, even if you repeat it millions and millions of times. So you can replicate the study and do exactly what I did, for example, but you won't come up with the exact same patterns. Okay, it's impossible because we're human. We do not ever have the exact same ideas. Okay, there, there are reasons for it. Of course, we're individuals. Okay, so this is um, how it's done. You're grouping the words, the data, to make sense of it, and it's your interpretation. Next, uh, with qualitative data analysis, um, you need to know the words, the sentences, all the responses that you get, and if you have pages and pages and pages of data and words, uh, you need to really know them. So you need to aggregate the words you can't possibly do it without a program, a software. Okay, so uh, you need to look up, there are lots of programs for uh, word analysis and getting words together uh, for different reasons, connecting words. Okay, very, very important, but you really have to know the information. Whereas in quantitative, you don't need to know anything. I don't know if you like that. I didn't like it. But with quantitative, with numbers, you don't need anything. Everything will be done for you. The number crunching is automatic and no thinking involved at all. Next is um, introspection. That means that you need to, regardless of the fact that it's very, very interpretive and very, very personal and subjective. You need to learn to meditate. This is where mindfulness meditation comes in very handy. You need to meditate, step back, observe in a non-biased way. Now, we, you know we're all biased, so that's a bit of a problem. So you have to try to learn about your biases and be as detached as you can. Now that means emotionally detached. Even though you love the words, you love your study, you still need to learn how to detach emotionally. 
okay? And this is where there's lots of personal work. You actually grow when you conduct a qualitative data analysis as a human being. It's a very humanistic kind of research. So there are lots of benefits uh, for those of you that are interested in self-development and learning about yourself, uh, conducting a qualitative uh, research study, action research study, would truly benefit you. Yes, that's right, Nevis. That's why I've written a few uh, blog posts where, actually, I think the one of the books, is, is it here in front of me? No, it's not here in front of me. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, Harvard University, Brian probably has it here. Harvard University has come up with a, uh, a way to learn about your biases. It's an online uh, questionnaire. So that, and I think this is a good thing to learn about our biases. And this will help. As long as you're aware of your biases, that's fine. That would work. Okay. But if you're lost with all the blog posts, um, there are ways to aggregate all the information. You may want to have create your own blog. You may want to use uh, Pearl. I think that Pearl Tree. Pearl Tree is a good way to do it. It's completely free and you can organize all the information for the Action Research Project. So think about Pearl Trees. That's for you, Brian, as well, because you, you've got a lot of information and um, Pearl Tree allows you to uh, organize it in a very simple way. Better than Scoop It or, I don't know, any other aggregation uh, method. So Pearl Tree, or is it Pearl's Tree? No, it's Pearl Tree. Uh, let me get the link unless Brian gets there before me. Yeah, it's Pearl Trees. Sorry about that. Pearl Trees. You can also work with someone else. In other words, you can add me, uh, Nevis and Brian and anyone else who wants to work with Pearl Trees. You can add me and we can work together. In other words, if you're missing something, I'll be able to add it for you. Oh, thank you, Brian. I beat you to it. Yay! Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Yes, so try Pearl Trees, completely free. Um, and if you need any help, and then we can work together. You can also work with others, invite people and, and um, work on this together. So quantitative, this is where it's easy. It's numbers, but it's so easy. Uh, quantitative data is analyzed deductively. So you identify the topic, you focus on the research questions, you collect, you analyze, develop conclusions, and you're done. Very easy. Okay, it can be descriptive or inferential statistics, and uh, that's easy. Lots of programs out there. You can do it with a whole population. A little bit about descriptive statistics. It measures a central tendency. Now, you get this from the numbers. Very, very easy. Thank you, Brian. That's the one. So you can add it to Pearl Trees right away, and then we can continue. That's right. That's an example. There are also lots of books out there on biases, and I think it's not only great as a researcher that you find that about biases, but as a professional, as a teacher, um, as a human being. I think it's uh, important for all of us to learn about our biases if we don't already know them. And we're actually not born with them, but we're born with uh, the, uh, the ability to acquire them. So if your mother is the first person that comes into your view as a baby, you'll have a bias towards women. If your father, you'll have a bias towards uh, males. And if it's a duck <laughs> or a dog, you'll have some kind of a bias or preference for dogs. Okay, and there's the story of the ducks who followed uh, the human being because that was the first. So with animals and humans, it's quite uh, common to acquire biases at a very early age. So descriptive analysis is doing the mean, the median, the mode. Very easy, the range, easy to do. I believe Google Drive also does it quite nicely. 
So you can do all the, your questionnaire, your survey on uh, Google, Google Form, get the questionnaire out there, get the information very easily on Google Drive, and you're done. But where's the fun? Okay, so if that's what you require, that's fine. You could also do um, mixed, as Hamlata mentioned. So descriptive analysis, you get an idea here of how things work. Okay, there's your uh, mean. You don't want to be here. You want to either have uh, it's weak if it's, uh, okay, moderate and then strong. Or if it's going up or down, you can see the correlation coefficients. If these words sound strange with Google Drive, you won't get any of the words. But you'll have to describe. And then, of course, you get histograms, bar charts, pie charts. All these are available on Google Drive if you do your questionnaire there. You can also try state stat crunch. Uh, and others that are complete. I don't know why this came up backwards. It started out backwards. I spent hours putting it from left to right, and then it went back to right on WizIQ. I have no idea what's going on here. In any case, analyzing data and action research. I hope this makes sense to you. Okay, this is a checklist. It's also available on the website, so you can get it there. Um, and I believe we've gone through this information. This is just a repeat of qualitative analysis that I've already mentioned. So I see there are a few pages that are double. <laughs> All right, let's continue. All right, so uh, this is an example of qualitative, well, you tell me. Is this qualitative or quantitative? I couldn't get the slides up, Nevis, for some reason at all. I, um, I did it through the, uh, the class. So you say quantitative. Let's see. Anybody else? Any other guesses? Yes, it is quantitative. Take a look. Two surveys, and this is what I did for my uh, action research project on um, reading comprehension tests. Brian, see if you can find that one. Reading comprehension tests, uh, action research that I did. So I did two online questionnaires. One was for students, one for parents, one for teachers, because I wanted to know how students felt, how parents felt, and how I never asked them. I just put this online, and I had over thousands and thousands, I don't know how many thousands, of um, respondees. And this was 10 years ago, so imagine if I did it now. I would have a lot more. <laughs> In those days, uh, there, were no, there was no Facebook or anything like that. Okay, so I don't. So I did pretty good for those days. And then I also had some offline questionnaires that I had done in class for the students, for the parents, and for the other teachers. So they were online and offline. Um, I don't think it's that one, Brian. It's called um, Action Research uh, by Nellie Deutsch. And it's on uh, reading comprehension. And let me see if I can get it. <clears throat> Trying to look for it. It's on Amazon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, here it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Here it is. I found it. This is the original. Um, survey. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. That's the original survey. And if you take a look at that, you'll notice that, I don't know why it's still out there. <laughs> it didn't cost me money because I was a student. But I believe it now costs money, and I don't even understand why it's still out there. 
Um, I don't think that email works because it's an old um, University of Phoenix uh, mail. They don't have those anymore. Um, they gave me a free account because I was, a st I don't know, I just convinced them. I don't know what I did. But they're called Question Pro. It was really good. I think you can go through it. If you click on Continue, you'll be able to get... Um, I don't know what you'll be able to get. What is this? I'm not sure. As far as I know, you can get the information. Yeah, you. oh, you can actually take it. Oh, my goodness. You can actually take the survey. I just realized that the survey is still out there. <laughs> you, can, you can take the survey. Can you imagine? Oh, that's the one, Brian. You got it. No, what is that? No, um, that's not the, um, the actual report. The actual report is somewhere else. It's out there. You can buy it. I think you can get it on, um, on Amazon. Amazon um, Nelly Deutsch on Kindle. Only on Kindle, I believe. Yeah, the book is out of print. But if you go into Kindle, you'll get it. Oh, it's very expensive. I don't know how to even get hold of it. I don't think I have any control over it. It's $10. It's actually great for English language teachers. I, I came up with some pretty good ideas for those days. I don't know if that works. Um, Yeah, okay, that's the one. So it's called ESL, Brian, this might help you. Uh, ESL, EFL, students lack the skills to cope with um, reading comprehension tests. Okay, that's the title. So you might be able to find um, the actual uh, paper online for free. Okay, all right, so that's what I did. Um, so I was doing quantitative when I really thought that I was a qualitative kind of person. And the results look like this. This is before the intervention, before I did anything. Remember, with action research, you first find out what the problem is, and then you try to come up with some kind of solution. You try it out, and then you have another um, survey to get the results. So this is the question. Um, what's going on here? There we go. All right, so this, I see the link is here. I don't know if this link uh, works. You can click on it uh, in the PowerPoint presentation on SlideShare, because I couldn't get it on WizIQ, by the way. I just couldn't. So these are the analysis. The first question for the students was, what thoughts do you have during the test? Do you have during the test? What thoughts do you have during... Okay, the reading comprehension test. What thoughts do you have? I wish I had prepared myself better. 25.7, well, you see the results of how many people felt that way. I won't have enough time is what they were thinking during the test. I'm doing great, 21%. And I wish I could be somewhere else, 14%. So you see, with, with uh, quantitative, you are feeding the student. They have no place to breathe. You're giving them, you're asking them specific questions. All right. So I don't know if I like that, but that's what I did. Um, so I presume that these were some of the things that they would be thinking. I presumed, but this is interpretive. It's very subjective. Remember, this is quantitative. Okay, I'm uh, pro-qualitative, as you can see. All right, another quest example of a question. There's noise. I don't know where the noise is coming from. Uh, it could be me. Or it could be the video that we had heard uh, before. Maybe I can get rid of it. And then um, 
you won't get the video. It could be the video. Uh, let me try to get rid of it. Okay, I'll. It could be that sometimes, depending on your connection, it could stay. Tell me if, if there's no noise anymore. If it's okay now. Um, no, but Mary had. Mary, is it okay? Because I think it was probably that. Yeah, I know there's no noise there, but for some people there could be. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. I hope, Mary, that it's okay now. Another question I asked the teachers was, ESL, EFL students are anxious during reading comprehension tests in English. Okay, now they had to respond to that. Now, I had to presume that it existed, that there was such a thing. Okay, so let's look at the results. Strongly agree. Notice that I had uh, a grading kind of questionnaire where I asked them strongly agree, agree, undecided, disagree, strongly disagree, which doesn't say very much, right? There's nothing in between. It's all black and white, which isn't life. You know, it's not really life. This might work for other uh, areas, but I think for teachers, uh, I think a mixed would work best. So strongly agreed. Notice um, only 34% thought that. 45 agreed. Some were undecided and some even disagreed. So that's pretty mean. Okay, somewhere in the middle. Another one was uh, teachers. What percent are were anxious during reading comprehension tests. So most, I gave the most, some, many, none. Most of my students are or were anxious. Notice the highest was some. Some doesn't say very much, does it? What is some? It means, well, at least one or two. Next, to parents. My daughter's son gets anxious when there is a reading comprehension test in school. Now this is what parents said. Notice Strongly agree. In other words, if you look at all of them, the students, teachers, and parents, who has the highest thoughts about anxiety during a reading comprehension test? Who thinks that uh, there is such a thing? Okay, if you recall. Oh, thank you, Brian. Yes, that's Okay, you want me to go back? Okay, let's go back so you get an idea, so you can see who has the highest. So we've got okay, anxious teachers strongly agree. Well, and agree together is like okay, uh, it's about uh, eighty percent. And then if we go on to teachers, teachers are the lowest. Notice teachers think that there's no such thing. Okay, it's only, it's less than 50%. Well, maybe together with the many, some, who knows. And with parents, it's pretty high. Okay, it's pretty high. So parents and students think that there is anxiety during the test. Parents, reading strategies would improve. Now, that's what I presumed. I presumed that if I would teach students how to practice reading strategies, they would do better. So I asked parents, what do you think? Would this help? So notice what parents thought. <laughs> Nobody disagreed. And there were a lot of parents, over a thousand, okay? So um, you can see that 91% Almost 92% of the parents think that uh, reading strategies would help their students. And then teachers. I asked teachers, would students benefit from relaxation exercises before a reading comprehension test? Teachers didn't seem to uh, think about this as being worthy of anything. Uh, but you've got 65% there saying that maybe. So this is what some of the questions and the results. I conducted a literature review to get a summary of the problem, to understand the problem better, see if I can find a solution. My strategy was um, 
a 12-week curriculum program where I would teach reading comprehension skills. I would provide test taking and relaxation techniques. In other words, I taught my students to do mindfulness in the classroom to relax. So I would do uh, different kinds of exercises. It wasn't just mindfulness. I did color visualization, uh, different methods. The reading strategies involved uh, talking about the paragraph, introduction, body, and conclusion, the, the layout of a paragraph, type of writing, whether it's letter, report, description, and so on, skimming and scanning practice for numbers, capital letters, and what they meant, and then the test-taking techniques involved relaxing exercises, mindfulness to focus on the present, breathing, counting one to ten, and then color visualization and the chakras. So <laughs> they learned about the chakras, you know, the different colors that go with the chakras and what they mean. And then they also did some positive affirmations. And by the way, I didn't make this up. None of this was made up. I got the information from the internet, from research studies on self-talk and positive affirmations. Okay, so... Uh, of course, time-wise, I had to organize the time. The results of after the 12-week uh, implementation on students, student stores soared. Students did so much better. <laughs> so it turned out that I was right. Okay, so the action research, I took the action. I implemented the program that uh, was based on research that I had conducted. And the results went up. So these are social, very low socioeconomic uh, uh, population. And the kids did well. They went from practically failing or getting a very low score to getting an 80 average. So I was quite happy. And that's what action research is about. Action research is about taking action based on a problem statement. Now, in order to be able to continue, I conducted feedback to get uh, teachers, parents, administrators to respond with questions and comments. And now it's your turn. Uh, any questions or comments? If you could add them in the chat box, or you can always Add them to the course feed. Okay, I'm looking for question marks. Any questions or thank you for your comment there that it was interesting. I'm glad to hear that or to, to read that, actually. Yes, mindfulness is great. But notice I got the ideas not from, I mean, I may have thought about them, but um, I had to, everything had to be research-based. In other words, I had to base uh, my uh, rationale for uh, building a new curriculum on whatever was out there. Okay, so now this is out there. You might want to do the same thing, by the way. You can replicate the same action research if you want it and, and change it in any way you want. Uh, that's allowed. You just have to give credit, of course, but that's fine. You do that in the references, so there's no problem with that. So you might want to replicate uh, the same study. And then, of course, the recommendations. That's the last part, the conclusion, the recommendations are the last part of your uh, report. Um, and you'll be doing a uh, PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, I recommend a needs assessment survey um, in the classroom in general, before, <laughs> not before exams, but when you get your students at the beginning of the year, conduct a needs assessment survey to learn about your students 
and give them a questionnaire on test-taking anxiety so you can be ready for those students. It might be the whole class, and then you'll be able to implement the program again. Also, uh, conduct a questionnaire on reading strategies to find out what your students know or don't know. Um, you can also conduct a research project on your new students. Do the same thing, replicate it. Do the same thing with your students again. It's a new class, a new year, why not? And then um, conduct a comparison of grades before and after taking the test. It's very easy. You do um, a, um, a survey questionnaire before they take the test to see how they do, and then you do one after. Uh, you implement the uh, curriculum planning, reflecting. Lots of reflecting on uh, this kind of work, but it's, um, it's a very uh, useful process because you learn a lot. So we've got about five minutes. I'd like to thank you for uh, coming to this class, and I hope you got... Um, something out of it and that you're going to roll your sleeves and get ready to go out there and conduct in September. Plan it now so you can uh, start conducting a research study at the beginning of the year. Start, you can start off where I started uh, at the end of mine. Start an assessment and um, see what's happening in your classes in any area. Any questions? Hello, Manny. I don't know when you came in. Um, I hope you were here long enough to um, get something out of it. Of course, you can uh, also have the uh, recording later on. I don't know if the recording works for everybody, but I know it works for those who came to the session. Thank you, Brian. I'm looking forward to your sessions. Uh, feel free to um, connect with me. You can find me anywhere. Um, the best place to find me and ask questions and get a direct response is uh, on Twitter.com, uh, uh, one of mine. Uh, Nevis follows me. Uh, I find Twitter very, very useful to share information and to learn from one another. It's instant learning. <laughs> it really is. So, um, Thank you, Mary. Thank you for joining. And um, let's connect on Twitter. Great, Nevis. Um, again, Pearl Trees. Uh, just um, thank you. Per Did I write Pearless? <laughs> I am Pearless. Yes, I keep asking my daughter to uh, get some pearls for me since she's the jeweler. Pearl Trees. Okay, that's what it's called. Get Pearl Trees. Um, I'll connect with you. <laughs> Invite me and uh, we'll be able to work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And go for it with your action research. Bye for now. Uh, of course, this is going to be added to YouTube and um, Vimeo. Think is important here. Think is really important here is uh, when you're conducting uh, your survey, you should have this in mind.